because I have a lot. Um, <laughs> buckle your seatbelts. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, good turnout. I guess my kind of link baity title here really worked. Um, this is CSS for engineers. Um, these slides are available on, online at slides.com slash Keith J. Grant. Um, but my, my goal here is um, not for you to walk out of this room ready to code the most amazing UI you've ever seen in CSS. Um, but what I, what I do want to do in this hour is, is take CSS and shift your thinking and shift the way you write CSS so that skills you already have as a programmer apply to CSS. Because CSS is this, is this crazy language that no one quite knows what to do with when they get started with it. Um, and it, it's something that drives a lot of people crazy. I mean, how many people here have really fought with CSS and have gone through periods of absolutely hating? I mean, so many people um, know what that's like. So real quick, who am I? I'm Keith Grant. Um, the J makes it so I'm actually findable in search results, so I stick that everywhere. Um, I work for Intercontinental Exchange as a senior web developer. Um, I do the CSS for our websites, um, theice.com and nyse.com. I also wrote um, a node application that we use that does our server-side page rendering. I do React.js, so I'm a developer, um, but I've always had a foot kind of in the world of design. So I've had kind of an awareness of what's going on in that world. And I'm currently in the process of writing CSS in action for Manning Publications. Um, I was hoping that we would have the advanced um, you know, partial preview um, early access program ready for today, but we don't. Um, it should be coming in about a month. Um, and hopefully we'll be in print um, sometime next summer, mid-year or so. Um, so I'm rapidly learning that book scheduling works a lot like software scheduling. Um, it doesn't exactly go according to plan. Um, but I've worked with CSS a lot. I've, I've always found myself being the CSS guy on a developer team um, at pretty much every job I've ever worked. Um, so I want to kind of share things I've learned along the way. Um, so let's talk about CSS. CSS is code. Now, it may seem obvious to say that. It may also seem kind of weird to say that because CSS is not a programming language. Um, <clears throat> it isn't Turing complete. It doesn't have variables, though the latest spec introduces something that it calls variables that are really more of constants than anything. Um, it doesn't have subroutines. It doesn't have a lot of the constructs we're familiar with in a programming language um, because it isn't a full programming language. Um, but it, it is code, and, and we need to think about it and treat it like code. We need to um, go through the same rigor um, and apply the same rigor to our CSS that we apply to our JavaScript or our Ruby or our Java. Um, we need to think about the architecture of how our CSS is, is organized, how it's laid out, um, so that we can maintain it into the future. Um, because if we don't, our CSS code becomes spaghetti code. And anyone who's worked with CSS for any length of time knows what CSS spaghetti code is like. You've got a 5,000 line file, and you need to make a change, and you scroll and scroll and scroll, and you hope you find the selector that does what you think it does, and you make a change, and you hope it works. Sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes you make a little change, and the whole page falls apart. And you have no idea what you're doing. Um, you're fighting with specificity. You can't find what you're looking for. Sometimes you just stick code at the bottom of the file and pray that it works. Um, but there has to be a better way. Um, there, um, we need to learn to cross um, the, that bridge of thinking where CSS is not just this little thing that we tack on. Um, to our web page to make it look nice. It's a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, and what makes it so difficult to work with is it spans this gap. It, it, it is part design, it's part art. Um, and, and you see that here. All the stuff, all the, all the declarations there, setting the padding and the spacing, the fonts, the colors, that's all kind of the art and the, the, that, that's the world of the designer. Um, and if you're a software engineer, that may not be the most familiar territory to you, um, which is okay because that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to turn our attention outside of the curly braces. We're going to look at the architecture that shapes our CSS and look at how um, we can bring the skills that we know from software, um, from programming, 
to bear on our CSS. And, and from there, we can consider the architecture of our CSS as a whole. Um, when your architecture is well designed, when it's thought through, and when you do the best practices and strive to keep your architecture in place, you get these benefits. It's understandable, maintainable, it's reusable. Um, you know exactly what you are looking at. When you look at a chunk of code, it's not some mysterious piece in the midst of, of um, you know, 5,000 lines. Um, and the reason we get to this 5,000 line file, if you think about it, is CSS started as just this little thing. I mean, five, 10 years ago, the CSS file was probably no more than 200, 300 lines of code. Um, it did some basic layouts on, on, the, on the page. And, um, and it was easy to maintain because it wasn't very long. You could just skim in there, scroll, and look, and, and find what you're looking for. Make a change, and it's usually without too much risk. The problem is the internet has gotten faster. Web pages have gotten bigger. Single page web apps are a huge thing now. And um, it's not uncommon to have way more CSS than that. Um, our, I looked up our, our CSS for the ice.com, and we've got 14,000 lines of CSS, um, which is just insane when you think about it. Um, but what, what, what is lucky for us is our industry has gone through this before. Um, back in the early days of computing, computers had five kilobytes, eight kilobytes of memory. Um, programs were little because the computer couldn't hold any more than that in memory. And it was only, you know, as, as computers grew, processors got faster, memory started to be measured instead of in kilobytes, tens of kilobytes, hundreds of kilobytes, megabytes. Um, we made this shift um, to object-oriented programming. And instead of putting all of our code in one place, we started to break it up into discrete modules. Um, I found this quote on Wikibooks. Uh, compared with procedural programming, a super superficial examination of code written in both styles revealed that object-oriented code tends to be broken down into vast numbers of small pieces with the hope that each piece will be trivial, trivially verifiable. That's our goal. You don't want a 5,000 line file CSS. You want 150 line files. And you want each file to be completely standalone, to make perfect sense, and be responsible for what it's responsible for. Um, so how do we get there? Um, it's, it, to get there, to, to figure out what that might look like, let's look at a conventional piece of CSS and kind of examine the problems with it. Examine the things that make it, quote, procedural. Um, and then we'll look at another code sample that's a little more, quote, object-oriented. And, and we'll look at some practices and ways to get from one to the other. Um, so this example, you have, you've got these long selectors and you kind of have to read them to know what you're talking about. So this first one, okay, it's, it's a layout and inside that you've got a header and inside that you've got a page title. Okay, that's a page title somewhere up in the, the header. And then you've got, oh, an article and comments and a list of comments apparently. And inside that, uh, a link with a button class. Okay, so that's a button. And you notice you really only need the last one to know what you're talking about. The, everything that comes before it is just about where that is on the page. So we have a title, we have a button, we have two more titles, very similar. You see there's some repetition here. You've got um, some sort of left side title and some sort of right side title in your header. Um, problems with these, they're all single purpose. These do one thing and they do one thing only. Um, that page title doesn't work if you put that class anywhere else on the page. Um, so if you wanted that same style somewhere else on the page, you have to write a new selector. Um, you've got repetition going on down below and it's intimately tied to the HTML structure of the page. In contrast, consider something a little more object oriented. Consider each of these as an object. You have a page title. The exact same code as we saw before, but now the selector has been trimmed down. And anywhere you put that class on the page, you know exactly what it's doing. Second example, button, same story. Now, you've got something a little funny going on here with this double hyphen, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, now, we have the one title style that we had before, and we have a modifier class that can be added to it to add that bottom margin. This code is reusable, flexible, and it's dry. <laughs> 
put the two side by side. Stuff inside the brace is pretty much the same. We've done a little bit of cleanup of repetition there, but you don't really even need to be super familiar with any of those rules and what they mean. If you've got a CSS file that your designer has given you, um, you can take this and kind of shift it and rework the architecture. You can refactor it um, into something that you can maintain into the future. Um, so how do we get there? How do we get from this mess to something that makes more sense? Well, thankfully, we've got a few practical methodologies. Um, the three big ones are OOCSS, which stands for Object Oriented CSS. It was invented by Nicole Sullivan. Uh, SMAX, which is personally my favorite of the three. Um, that stands for Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. And one called BEM. Now, I could just spend the rest of the hour going through these and showing you all the rules that come with them. And you could follow those rules, and that'd be great. But I think something much more exciting is why those rules work. Um, how taking, by following the rules of these systems, <clears throat> you can translate your CSS into an object-oriented structure. And by doing that, all of the principles you know about object-oriented programming suddenly apply to CSS. And you can take the last 40 years of knowledge of our industry and put it to work. So I'm gonna give you a crash course on SMACs. Um, hopefully enough just to frame the discussion and enough for you to understand um, what I'm talking about. Um, this is what it stands for. It's created by Jonathan Snook. <clears throat> and if you go to smacks.com, um, he actually has about 90% of the book available for free online. I highly recommend it. Um, and if you, I mean, if you want kind of some of the advanced chapters, you can, you can order the book. It's really reasonably priced. Um, the basic premise of Smacks is this. You break up your CSS into these five rules. Or, sorry, five types of rules, I guess. Base, layout, modules, state, and theme. So we'll look through those one at a time. Your base rules kind of set the default values for the page. You, you put a bottom margin on paragraphs. You've got a body and a form that strip off the default browser margins. You set links, um, things like that. These are tag selectors only. These are just base level defaults. Um, and if you've got browser refret, re, reset library, like normalize.css, you put this in there too. Um, you just put all your, all your base rules in one, one file. If it really gets long, you can, you can split it into two. Um, but what that, do, that does is that just gives you a clean foundation and a, and, a, and a solid starting point to build up from. After that, you build your layout. Now, layouts on, on the internet can get very complicated. You have really complex web page layouts, but this is just high level. Um, you shouldn't have more than two or three of these per page, maybe four or five in a really complicated page. This is your header, this is your sidebar, this is your main content, this is your footer. Um, and in these selectors, it's okay to use IDs um, because this is the only place IDs are going to show up in your CSS. And that's all that makes up the selector. So sidebar, main, footer. Um, if IDs really make you uncomfortable, prefix a class name with an L. Then when you see it, you know exactly what it means. That's your layout. And next are module rules. And this, this is the meat. 90% um, or so of your CSS will be module. And what you do is you break up your code into reusable objects. This is, this is the parallel um, with object-oriented code. And each one goes in its own file, so that when you open up that file, you can see the entire module. And, um, and so it should work in any context. Notice that the selectors have nothing about where they are on the page. So this media module, which we'll examine in a second, can be anywhere. You can put it in the sidebar, you can put it in the header, you can put it in the footer, you can, you can nest one inside of another one, and it works. Because the selector doesn't require it to be anywhere on the page. Um, now, you may wonder, how do you fight with selector specificity? What if you've got a more specific selector trying to override things? The point is, you won't. If everything you write is a module, nothing will be reaching in and modifying something else's look and feel. Um, we'll see more examples of that as we go. So, so what does this module look like? Um, this is a media module, and it's designed to have a parent object, parent element with the media class. 
And on one side, we'll have an image. So we select with using the direct descendant selector, move the image, and then next to that will be a body. And then inside the body will be a title. And we have namespaced all these class names with the name of the module. So that we see those classes anywhere on our page, we know they're associated with the module. Now, what does the HTML look like? Pretty simple. Um, media, we've got our image kitten. Um, if you really wanted to, you could use a class rather than the image tag. Um, and then our body, title, some more text, and it renders to this. Now these are, as I said, they're context independent. They're really flexible. You can put them anywhere on the page. You can even put them inside of other media objects. Here we've got two nested inside of an outer one. Well, what if you want a different style? So. In this case, we've got a button, and your boss comes to you and says, that button in the sidebar needs to be different than the other buttons. It needs to be bigger, or it needs to be a different color, or it needs more padding around it. Um, the, the procedural approach would be something like this. Oh, well, in a sidebar, we select the button, and we change its font size. But that's not how you do it with Smacks. What you do is you subclass it. This is sort of parallel to inheritance. So, We've got our button module, and we create a button submodule. Button dash dash large, sorry. And then we just add both classes to the element, and now that button inherits, the button large inherits from the button class, and you've got a modified version of your button. So Smacks gave us base rules, layout rules, module rules. Fourth is state rules, which are usually associated with a module. These are for the dynamic condition of, of state. If something is loading, if something is disabled, if something is in any sort of, of state that, that's probably typically toggled by your JavaScript. Um, put these rules with the module that they belong to um, in the same file. So our nav menu here at the bottom, that nav menu would have this is, is active selector on a list item inside of the nav menu. Um, section is collapsed. Um, prefix these with is dash, so you know exactly what they are, or has dash, sometimes that just makes more sense to use has. <clears throat> and finally, we have theme, theme rules. Um, and in the book Smacks, he kind of glosses over this, and he says it's not necessary on most sites, which is true, so I'm going to gloss over it as well. But now that we've moved into to Smacks, we have Simply a general principle, idea of how that works. We've taken CSS and we've rethought how we structure it. And we've, we've shaped it to mimic object-oriented code. Um, so now we have modules, which are discrete objects. And if we consider them objects and step back and think about all the principles of object-oriented programming that we know, we can apply them. And, and by applying them, um, we, we can make code that is more maintainable, we can make code that is reusable, that's more in, intuitive to read when you look at it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step through a series of um, object-oriented programming principles, which you should hopefully be familiar with, you should, at least most of them. Um, and I'll briefly define them, and I'll show you how we can bring those to bear on our CSS. So the SMACS is kind of the how, um, and definitely look it up and read more about it later. Hopefully you understand enough that I can explain to you the why. I think the why is far more interesting because we can get code that is way more easy to manage. So first rule. This isn't really just object-oriented programming. It's kind of programming in general, but don't repeat yourself. There should be a single source of truth. Um, all of your information should exist in one place. If, if it needs to change, you should have to change one thing, and it should ripple through the rest of your code. So if you want to change the padding on a title, this certain type of title, you want to be able to change that in one place, and everywhere that title appears on the page, you want it to have a type of effect. It gives you less to maintain and uh, less prone to error. <clears throat> so, to do this, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was on this slide a minute ago. No, I was, it's being slow. Um, <laughs> uh, general purpose modules. So instead of the more conventional 
code which we have here. Let's refactor it into a more object generated oriented approach. So we've got two, two headers here that are identical in style. Um, one is an H2 on, say, the index page of a blog. You've got your blog articles listed out, each title. And then the other one is on the page of a single article. It's the H1 on that page, but it looks the same as on the index page. Well, one thing you can do to dry it up is just put the selectors together. Separate them with a comma, and, and there, you're dry. But we're still not object-oriented because we've got those crazy selectors going on in there. And what if you needed to use that style somewhere else? What if you decide that there's a third page, a third place, where you want that sort of title to appear on the page? Well, you could add another selector in there, but you can see this is going to start to get crazy. I mean, what if you start adding a fourth and a fifth and a sixth? Obviously, it's much easier to just build a module. Post title, bam, it works. Put that class anywhere you want that to appear. <clears throat> Here we have three buttons. Primary button, which is, they're mostly the same, but this one is blue with white text. We've got an inverted button, which is white with blue text. We've got a danger button, which is red with white text. So break it up. Take the repeated part and move it up into the base module. Here's your button. It's got the padding, it's got the border race and the margin. And that class can be added anywhere you need a button. And when you want to modify it, add a primary modifier, add an inverse modifier, add a danger modifier. Um, you can also utilize your preprocessor for dry. Um, sometimes you need the same typography, especially, um, is really common with this. Sometimes you need the same type of text to appear multiple places. Well, you don't necessarily want to put these selectors all together. You don't necessarily want to use the same class everywhere um, because it's, it's possible that your page, your panel title may change someday and you don't want that to change your modal title or your list heading. So write a mix in um, and um, this produces duplicate output, but your source code is dry. And your source code still gives you one place to change it and it will, it will produce um, the changes everywhere you need it. Um, I use the mix in here. You can also use extends um, with stats or less. <clears throat> but I would also want to caution you that not all duplication is bad. Sometimes things just happen to be the same. Here we have two elements um, with the same font size, the same bottom margin. Um, and sometimes they just they happen to be the same. Changing one doesn't mean you want that change to apply to the other. So this sort of duplication is safe. Um, but, you know, that gray color, you kind of want to normalize that, so maybe we'll put that in a variable in our preprocessor. Another rule of object-oriented programming, single responsibility principle, or SRP. Um, this states that every class, or in our case, every module, should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality provided by the software. That responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by the module, and all its services should be narrowly aligned with that responsibility. This means that each module should do one thing. <clears throat> this module, registration button, it's got kind of a lot going on inside of the selector. It's got um, layout with the inline block and the border radius, kind of define its size. It's got a font size, it's got colors. Um, this would probably be better served breaking it up into helper classes. You've got a base button that just does one thing. And you have extension classes that give it mix and match pieces. This, this enables you to create a whole array of various types of button without a whole lot of code. Because if you just define all these helpers, you just mix and match them how you need them in your HTML. The other thing is the module should do only one thing in its entirety. This module has a lot of moving parts. So we have a panel that has a title and a body, and it has some sort of split left-right content going on here. And it's got a footer and maybe some sort of close button. Um, single responsibility principle would say break that up into multiple modules. So we could create a panel module with the title and a body. You could create a split module that does nothing more than put one half on one side and one half of the content on the other. 
you got some sort of button row module. I didn't really define what's going on there. Um, and you could have your button class. <coughs> Martin Fowler says this in his book, Clean Code. The first rule of classes is that they should be small. The second rule is they should be smaller than that. I highly recommend this book. If you have not read this book, you need to read it. It is required reading on our team. Um, not everything in that book is going to be ap applicable to CSS, but, um, but you should read it. Uh, another rule, open-close principle. This one's a little trickier to define, um, but what it states is this. A module should be open for extension, but closed for modification. And, and this has been interpreted a number of different ways in, in programming, um, one of which is, that, is this, once a class has been compiled and shipped, it cannot be changed unless you need to fix a bug in it. Um, the thinking is in a compiled language that you can compile that thing and, and just dr create new extension classes anytime you need to tweak its behavior, but you don't need to recompile that file. You just have new extension classes. So in CSS, we've got search module here. And if you want to want to change how that search module behaves, you could select in it based on its location, but that's unsafe. That is something outside of the module reaching into the module and changing what it does. And that is what you want to avoid. Instead, you add a modifier class. <clears throat> this extends it to functionality. This is not going to accidentally be applied to your web page. You've got to add this class. Um, whereas with the you know the second fix here, second second box here, um, you don't really know what that's going to grab on your page. It could reach in there and grab anything. Um, so this makes everything explicitly opt in by the HTML. Um, you're not going to accidentally apply styles, and your CSS stays backwards compatible. You have an implicit promise that once you've shipped your CSS, you're not going to ship a new version that breaks anything that uses it. So, closed for modification, open for extension, or open for inheritance. But, another rule of object-oriented programming is phase over composition over inheritance. Break the problem into smaller parts. This is the nav menu for the ice.com. Um, it has a lot of things going on here. You've got the nav bar on the top. And as you hover over any of those items, a big white box like this appears. It's got some links. Um, it's got some headers. It's got a little image. Um, now, when you, when you are told, like I was a few months ago, you need to build a new nav menu for the website, you could easily just dive right in and say, OK, I'm going to create a nav menu module um, and start writing and go crazy. Um, what you'll quickly find is that everything happening here is probably around 500 lines of CSS. If that's one module, it's not going to be maintainable. So in my case, I broke it up into eight. We have the nav bar, which styles just the black strip across the top. I've got a flyout drawer, which is basically the container that opens and closes for the whole white box there. Um, there's a simple grid system, which gives me my four columns. The list featured is the list with the header. So Features and options, and then all the links beneath it is one instance of a list featured module. And I've got another one in the next column, got another one in the next column. Um, the image on the far right with its header and text is a media promo. Um, I used a split module down at the bottom, which we saw earlier, to put one piece of content on the left, one piece of content on the right. Um, list featured inline is a modification of this, of the featured list. That allows the links to lay out inline. And we've got a button class. Um, these pieces can all be used anywhere else on the page. If I need another list that looks like this in my footer, it's a piece of cake to do it because I've already got the CSS written. If someone says, I need a promo image like that, it's not bound up in this um, nav menu. It's a little module that lists, lives discreetly and can be plugged in anywhere you want on the page. Another principle of programming is immutability. And this isn't one you necessarily see very often in object-oriented. This is a little bit more of a functional programming thing. But, um, but I think there's some interesting things we can take from it um, in CSS. <clears throat> this states that 
an immutable object, the value cannot be changed once it's created. Um, it's not dependent on state or conditions. And it's simple, it's predictable. You know that once you define something, it's not gonna change out from underneath you. You're not gonna have weird side effects. Um, so what does this mean in CSS? It's a little, little weird, it's a little abstract to apply, but I, th I think you can do it. Um, here we have a dialog module. And that dialog module inside of it expects an H3, which aligns the text left. And we have another module, text center module, that aligns the text center. Problem is, what happens when you put these together? Now I've got a text center on my H3 in the dialog. Specificity says that the dialog H3 is more specific, so that should apply. So our text is gonna left align, even though we clearly want it to be centered. Now how do we fix that? This is important. That may seem kind of weird because we've kind of been told for a long time, never use important. This is the one case, oh, my slides are behind, I'm sorry. I think this is the Wi-Fi freaking out, thinking the two were in use here. <clears throat> Using important, because this is a utility class. This utility class, the way I define it, is basically, it's a very simple module, one line only, maybe two or three if the second and third declarations are something that support the main declaration. I guarantee you, anywhere you put this class on the page, you want the text to be centered. You're not gonna just accidentally have text center somewhere in the page, and this important is gonna you know, screw you over by centering your text. So we're talking about immutability. If I haven't driven this point at home enough, don't reach into other modules and do things. Let the module modify itself through extension. And one final principle of object-oriented programming, inversion of control. Um, now, if you were in um, Kyle's talk this morning, he was kind of poo-pooing something about a version of control, but it is a good thing in general. Um, this is a little tricky to define. It's almost it's easier to explain by example if you're not familiar with it. Um, it, it. So here's an example. In a conventional piece of code, we have a text editor, and in the constructor, it instantiates its own spell checker, and it holds onto a reference to the spell checker. And it uses that spell checker for whatever. Um, the class is totally in charge of its own logic. It runs its own thing. Through inversion of control, what you do is you would give it a spell checker. All it knows about is the interface. Um, so you can swap out that spell checker with different spell checkers. You can give it a German spell checker if you wanted. You give it an English spell checker. You do whatever you want with it. It still works. Um, but it has been completely decoupled from a concrete implementation of the spell checker. <clears throat> this quote from Designing Reusable Classes, inversion of control gives frameworks the power to serve as extensible skeletons. The methods supplied by the user tailor the generic algorithms defined in the framework for a particular application. This means you can have a framework that accepts concrete implementations of things and, and does its own stuff with it. It makes the framework much more flexible much more reusable. Well, how do we apply this to CSS? In CSS, I can think of one place in particular where something is coupled tightly to something else, and that is CSS as a whole and HTML. We have, um, for a long time, we have written our HTML first, and then come along and written CSS that works with that particular HTML. It produces those big long selectors, and um, and you know that it's it's completely dependent. If you change the HTML, you're going to have to change the CSS. I I think that relationship needs to be reversed. CSS needs to be in control. I call this approach CSS first. Now maybe you've heard of mobile first. Maybe you've heard of content first or API first. I say CSS first. Um, your HTML depends on your CSS. It is not the other way around. Your CSS is the very first dependency of your web application. It should be written to stand alone 
and it should not know anything about the HTML that uses it. <clears throat> because when you reverse it, when you get it wrong, your CSS conforms to the HTML. You write the HTML first, your CSS will look like the HTML. Now, I don't know what HTML this came from, but I can probably figure out most of it, and I guarantee you the HTML existed before that CSS did. <clears throat> but the problem is your HTML is very prone to change. You always need to change the content, and you're always deciding, oh, this thing needs to go on the other side, this thing needs to go on the bottom, <clears throat> and we need to move things around. We need a new page that looks like this. Um, if your CSS architecture depends on the structure of that web page, your, your CSS architecture is going to have to change every time your web page changes. When you reverse it, that's not true, especially because we have applied principles of immutability to our CSS. We know our CSS is stable, standalone, and individual pieces of it are not going to change out from underneath us. You need to think like you're on the bootstrap team. You're writing a tool set for use by your web app or by your web page. You're not writing CSS for one web app. You're writing CSS that is generically usable by any web app. The CSS you write defines and exposes an API for the HTML to use. And the HTML, instead of depending on a concrete implementation of CSS, now depends on the interface that you've defined. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> How do you do this? Well, two things. One, it should be documentation driven. You should, when you need to write CSS, do something to your web page, you should put the HTML you have aside, you should go to your CSS, and you should look for anything that emulates what you, that's close to what you're trying to do. You should find the button that looks right. You should find a media component that looks right. Find a module that gives you what you want. If you've already got it, you don't need to touch the CSS. You just add the right classes to your HTML. If you don't have it, then you need to write it. You need to create a new module. Um, and you should build that module in its own context, unaware of the HTML. If you document it, the documentation page itself becomes like your unit test. You can thumb through the documentation. You can find examples of all the modules that your CSS provides. And you know exactly what you're looking for. I mean, you know exactly what you can get out of it. <clears throat> if you document it, if you write an implementation of HTML that uses your new CSS module, um, then you see it working. You see it in action completely outside of the context of your web page or your web app. Then you can go over to your web app, plug in that CSS, follow the same rules, use the same class names, and it will work. The second important element of this is that it should be versioned. Um, <clears throat> you should use Simver. Um, this allows you to safely deprecate features. Um, dead code elimination is a problem in CSS. It's really difficult to do. Um, but if you say, OK, we've decided that the orange warning button is no longer going to be supported, you can deprecate it. You can put out a change log that informs anyone using the HTML that you're going to remove that feature in the future. But the HTML is opting into a specific version. The HTML, whoever's managing that HTML, whether it's you or someone else on your team, isn't going to be left out in alerts because you removed a feature out from underneath them. They're locked into a known version of your CSS, and they know, because you've got a change log, that if they want to bump their version of CSS, they need to make sure that they're not depending on that feature. <clears throat> so, <laughs> OOCSS, SMAX, and BEM. Um, look these up. My recommendation to you is to get vaguely familiar with all three. I've already given you a good introduction to SMAX. Um, and pick the one that you like and learn it in depth. Um, apply it 100% and then glean bits and pieces from the other two. Um, some of the conventions you saw, like the double hyphen I used to show extension, actually comes from BEM. Um, OOCSS is much uh, more loose. It's just basically two rules, separate uh, content from container and separate structure from skin. Um, if you look that up online, you'll be able to see examples of what, what that means. Um, SMAX, the whole book is line, uh, available online on SMAX.com. 
Um, BEM is the most structured of the three. It's got a lot of rigid rules. It tells you exactly what to do. Um, and if you follow it, you know, you, you won't go wrong. Um, but I think far more important than just the rules that come with these systems is, um, is the why they work, is understanding um, that our object-oriented thinking and programming applies to CSS as well. It gives us code that's more maintainable. It gives us code that's more um, understandable. You can open up a module and you know exactly what it does. It's all there at a glance. It's probably no more than 70 lines of code. Um, and you know exactly how to use it on the page. So, thank you. Um, the MEEP, Manning Early Access Program of my book, should be available in about a month, I hope. Um, you can follow CSS in action on CSS for updates. Um, you can follow me at Keith J. Grant. I'm, I will tweet links to this slide here in a few minutes. So, thank you. Yeah, oh, you have a question? <laughs> I am, um, you guys basically just got, I haven't written, I've written um, eight chapters, I've written, yes, eight chapters of 28, so it's going to be a, it's not going to be a long book, but it's going to have a lot of parts. Um, you guys basically just got a preview of chapter 10, which is still unwritten. Um, I think I will give a rough introduction to all three. Um, I'm still wrestling that out, but I don't, I don't want to pick one and, and, you know, be wrong in five years having, BEM is looking to be the most popular right now. It seems to be gaining the most traction. Um, it, it, my complaint about it is it produces some really ugly code. It's got a lot of double hyphens and double underscores in your class names and it, it's very verbose. Um, but it's also very structured and, and you can see, you can see that, okay, a double underscore means that it's, a subcomponent of a of a bigger module, and a double hyphen means it's a it's a you know extension of a base module. They use the, the word the term block. Um, the three of these, yeah, to confuse matters more. Um, OOCSS calls them objects. Smax calls them modules, and BEM calls them blocks. They're all the same thing, roughly. Um, I would typically do it by adding the classes in the HTML because that way um, all you've given to the HTML, if you're, if you're writing the CSS only, you're giving the HTML the option and then the HTML can choose, it can opt in exactly what it wants and it can mix and match however it needs to. So you could probably make an argument for the other way. If you know you're taking the base class, it should get the, or if you take an extension class, you know you want the base class. It, it, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. That's a, that's a tricky question. Um, the, um, I personally put it in with the module um, because it is, it's related to that module. When you use the module, you, you just want it to, to work. You don't want to have to think about all that, all that stuff. Um, um, Another guy gave a talk really similar to this one actually a few weeks ago, and I, his name is escaping me at the moment. Um, but he, he made the point about immutability, and, and I actually stole that from him. And his, he made the argument that even media queries are breaking immutability. I'm, I'm not convinced of that yet, but he might be right. And he actually defined a, a separate class for each breakpoint, media breakpoint. Um, I think practically that may be more pain than it's worth. Um, because you don't want to have to think about that when you're writing the HTML. HTML should be more or less simple. So, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I usually just stick a bunch of media queries at the bottom of the module file. <clears throat> Anything else? Um, we actually, I use Bootstrap. Um, we had a really tight deadline when we first rolled out the redesign of our of our web pages. And what I did is I took the Bootstrap source file, the the less directory, and I just wrote new less files and compiled right compile it all together. Um, and actually, you can go really far with Bootstrap if you do that and just modify their variables, um, change the default colors, change the default border radius. Um, you can actually really reshape 
bootstrap um, just by doing that before you layer more on top. Um, typically, bootstrap won't give you everything you need. Um, there, you're always going to find something you've got to add to it. Um, but by all means, take their code and just layer on top of it. And, and you know, when you start to think about optimization, think about anything you can yank out. You don't need all of Bootstrap necessarily. So, anything else? All right. Thank you.